I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have with me as my guest Dr. Justin Paquette. Dr. Paquette is a neurosurgeon who practices complex spine surgery in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Paquette did his medical training at Albany Medical College. He then went on to complete a residency in neurosurgery at the Harvard Tufts Combined Program in Boston, Massachusetts. From there, he completed a fellowship in complex spine surgery in Los Angeles at Cedar sinai Good afternoon, Justin. Good afternoon. Dr. Baguette, today what I'd like to discuss is a relatively new procedure called the artificial disc replacement, uh, and we're specifically uh, talking about artificial disc replacement in the neck. Um, tell us a little bit about this. I mean, this is a new procedure that seems to be very popular these days. Sure. So essentially the purpose of an artificial disc is uh, to preserve the normal motion of the spine. In the old days we would just uh, fuse a level, and we do this today as well, where we fuse a level and take the motion out of it so as to uh, uh, prevent uh, any more pressure on a nerve or on the spinal cord. The artificial disc, however, instead of fusing two vertebrae together, actually links in between where the disc was, but allows bending, twisting, flexing, extending in all the normal directions. Now the main reason why this was developed was based upon theory uh, called the adjacent segment degeneration. And what this theory states is that if you take one segment of the spine and you fuse it, you've basically taken one motion segment out of the spine. And so if you had, say, seven uh, discs or six discs in the spine, all doing certain amounts of movement, and you took one uh, disc and stopped it from moving, now the other discs have to pick up the slack. And now they have a little more extra motion, extra stress, and they may wear out faster than they would have normally. And so the, reason, the reasoning behind developing the disc was that if we can preserve the motion, perhaps we can uh, prevent that adjacent segment degeneration, prevent the worsening stress in the other discs, and perhaps prolong the life of the neck. Okay. So if I understand you correctly, the, the artificial disc is really a new option, so to speak, for situations where otherwise you would have done an anterior cervical discectomy or fusion. That's correct. And... When you do an artificial disc, other than the advantage of retaining motion, do you get better pain relief? Do you get a better result than, than you would get with your typical anterior cervical discectomy infusion? It's interesting. The, uh, the data is just basically coming out right now from the FDA studies. It's showing at least equivalency and then sometimes superiority to, uh, to standard fusion procedures. One of the reasons may be is that um, in fusion surgeries, we can't use any kind of anti-inflammatories after surgery because anti-inflammatories are anti-fusion. Mm -hmm. But in the um, artificial disc category, we can use as much of that as we want to because we're not going for a fusion. And so that may help to actually control the, pain, the patient's post-operative pain. So uh, what does that mean? Does that mean that if, uh, if I'm a patient and I'm looking at the option between having a, an artificial disc or having the older anterior cervical discectomy infusion, that I'm going to have a better post-operative course or a year down the road, am I better? It looks like, like about a year, a year out, they're probably pretty similar, but there's a much faster recovery with those that have the artificial discs. So it's a, it's a, a, a faster yes. recovery. <clears throat> How about uh, surgery-wise? Is it a harder surgery? Is it easier? For you as a technician, mm -hmm. when you look at the difference between doing an anterior cervical discectomy infusion and an artificial disc, what's the difference? In, in essence, they're very similar surgeries. They're both done with a small incision in the side, coming from the front, taking the whole disc out and putting a, an implant between the two bones. However, the artificial disc has to be done much more precisely. A, a fusion, if you, as long as you get a block of bone in there in the right area and the, the plate goes on is locked in, in the right area, the bone's going to fuse, the patient will do well. But the positioning of the artificial disc is critical. If you think about it, the, the biomechanical properties of the spine is absolutely dependent upon where each bone is located. And they all have to uh, move in all these different directions together. If it's off balance, then you're going to no longer have normal motion, and that's actually going to hurt you more than help you. And so the disc has been designed based upon the normal biomechanical properties of the spine to be placed in exactly the right spot. And so what we do is we spend much more time with um, x-rays uh, and um, with um, uh, the microscope to make sure that when we place it, it's dead center in, inside the disc space. 
So am I correct in assuming that, that the operation takes a little longer than it would take you to do an anterior cervical discectomy fusion? I would say it probably takes a little bit longer, okay. not much. Okay. And how about recovery-wise? Um, you, you, you mentioned that people uh, can be treated more aggressively with anti-inflammatories and that sort of thing. Um, do you see that patients are able to return to work faster? Do you release them faster when they have an artificial mm -hmm. disc? Or, or is it the same as the anterior cervical discectomy fusion? Sure. My personal experience has been that it's pretty, it's pretty similar. Patients may return to work a little bit faster, and it's, again, probably related to the anti-inflammatory usage. But in general, it's pretty close. People leave the hospital either the same day or the next morning, driving within a week, working within a couple of weeks, physical therapy all at six weeks. Now, if you look at the FDA studies, uh, there's a trend towards artificial discs going back to work earlier. Um, but in my practice so far, it seems relatively similar, but they're feeling better during the recovery process. Okay. Um, any, any other substantial differences between the patients that you would recommend an artificial disc to someone you would advise them that they should have the old tried and true method mm -hmm of the anterior cervical discectomy infusion. How do you make the decision? Sure. Well, there are certain definite contraindications to uh, certain individuals getting the artificial discs. Those would be anybody with fractures uh, or dislocations, uh, anybody with spinal tumors, certainly not. Osteoporosis is a uh, contraindication. Uh, women over a certain age are going to be a contraindication also because of uh, bone quality. If the, um, if the joints in the back of the neck are completely gone, Remember that the joints and the discs are, are very closely connected at the same level. If the joints are totally gone and the disc is totally gone, there's no point in trying to salvage that level. They're still going to have lots of pain. If it's, if it's gone beyond moderate degrees of degeneration, the patient should probably go ahead with a fusion. So if I, if I understand that, then it would seem that uh, the older you get, the less likely you are a candidate uh, for an artificial disc. That's correct. So that's... The artificial disc tends to be a solution for the younger person mm -hmm. at this day and age. Now, how about levels? I'm assuming today, uh, in 2008, uh, when we're talking, this has been released to the open market. So this is no longer experimental. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you can go to a neurosurgeon and have an artificial disc put in essentially anywhere in the country if, if, if they do it. So it's not experimental. Correct. Correct. Insurances are paying for it. That's not a problem. What if I've got two artificial or, or two bad discs? Mm -hmm. Can I get two artificial discs in this country or no, is it still just The one? problem with that is that uh, the uh, FDA study was for single levels. There are some studies going on now that are two levels, but um, an FDA uh, usage is per pure one level disc disease. Of course, the problem of which is that you know, most people have multiple discs that are bad in the neck. Um, but, and there are some places that will do it off label for two levels, but that's certainly not recommended. Um, and the other issue, which you just mentioned, the insurances um, are not exactly making it easy to get these paid for either. Uh, some of the initial lumbar artificial discs had quite significant complications, and based upon that, I think that a lot of the insurance companies are really uh, making it difficult uh, for um, uh, patients to uh, get a qualified for artificial discs. At this day and age, what about the patient who, uh, as you had mentioned, may have had a cervical fusion, one level, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And now, because of the increased stress above and below that fusion, one of those segments is going bad. If you have a fusion at one segment, can I consider having an artificial disc in that segment above? Uh, yes, it's an absolute possibility. In fact, we've just done a couple of those recently. So that's not a contraindication, not any contraindication. other surgery, anything like that. No. Um, in terms of complications, you know, obviously we're operating on someone's neck. The spinal cord is right there. Uh, there's lots of big blood vessels. Is there anything about the artificial disc that you worry about differently than you would uh, your traditional anterior cervical discectomy infusion? As a surgeon, what do you worry about as a complication when you do an artificial disc? I think that probably pretty similar as far as complications, which would have to do with blood vessels, um, have to do with the nerves that are there, et cetera. The amount of outside exposure is very similar. What's different is that everything has to match up perfectly. And so you have to spend more time 
uh, drilling down the bone uh, inside and outside to make sure that the disc, when it goes in there, is totally flush in all directions. And we look at it on the microscope and then also take many x-rays as well. And so um, certainly th there's more risk of hitting outside structures while you're doing that part of the procedure. But the only thing that's in my hands is that is it different than a normal one is you spend a little extra time making sure that everything just fits like a glove. Now, this is a relatively new operation, at least in the United States. It's been done in, in Europe for some years. Mm -hmm. Can you give us, as a person who is on the bleeding edge of, of spine surgery, where's this all headed? What's next? I mean, is, is the artificial disc sort of the epitome of state-of-the-art technology, or are we seeing new things on the horizon in the cervical spine that are going to make even the artificial disc mm -hmm. seem old hat. Sure. The artificial, artificial disc definitely is an advance that's um, a, a very exciting for us, uh, especially much more so than the lumbar disc. I think the cervical disc, it makes more sense. There's less forces of gravity on it than there is in the lumbar spine. I think that they'll survive much better. Um, first of all, uh, we're still in the early generations, as you, as you point out. Some of the newer designs that will be available in the next year or two are going to be significantly better than the ones we even have just now. And they'll allow us to do multiple levels at the same time without any difficulties. Uh, so that in itself will be uh, a significant advance. They're also working on ways on replacing the joints in the back, um, facet joint replacements, uh, which uh, for a disease that doesn't affect the disc, but just that, will be a useful um, uh, adjunct. But I think ultimately the most interesting thing is going to be the development of stem cells and the usage of uh, uh, stem cells in the uh, rehabilitation and the regrowing of intervertebral discs. So you take a disc that looks pretty bad, rather than putting any metal in there, just take a little needle, squirt it in there, and then over time have that regenerate a nice new disc for us. Well, that definitely seems like the holy grail. It sort of seems like the fountain of youth. That is, well, close enough. <laughs> well, it, any, any parting comments to patients who may be trying to make that difficult decision, mm -hmm. and they're talking to their surgeon, they may have got, had a second opinion, trying to make that distinction between should I have an artificial disc, a relatively new technology, or should I stick with a tried and true anterior cervical discectomy infusion? Any pearls of wisdom for those folks? Sure. I think that both surgeries are, are very good surgeries. I think that in the right hands, patients would do well with either of those things. The thing to keep in mind is that this is still a new surgery. The last thing that you want to do is try to push the bounds of indications for this uh, artificial disc. We all need to be very careful to only put the disc in just the, the special patients who are going to do great with it. If you start to bend uh, the, uh, the character a little bit and put it into older people or people that shouldn't really need it, I think that's when we're going to start to notice complications and problems. And so it's very important that when you have your discussions with your physician, realize what the realistic uh, limitations of each device is. Well, I think that'll, that'll definitely help our our battle with the insurance company so that if they don't see us having a lot of complications uh, uh, with this new procedure, they're more likely to pay for it when it's indicated. Absolutely right. Okay, well thanks. Fascinating thanks. discussion. Thank Appreciate you. it. Appreciate you coming by. Thanks for watching today. If you have questions about the topic that we discussed today or any orthopedic topic, be sure to visit eorthopod.com. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon or healthcare provider interested in participating as a guest on eorthopod TV, you'll also find instructions on how to apply to become a guest on eorthopod TV. Thanks for watching.